do it, but shit. Oh my god. All right, next section is weight and balance. You guys want to roll into it? I want to. I want to get right into weight and balance. Key terms, center of gravity, CG limits, reference datum, basic empty weight, unusable fuel. There's some of the fuel in the airplane that you cannot use. I'm going to use a very embarrassing example for one pilot. I'm not going to, I don't mention names when I talk about pilots, but this happened a couple years back about unusable fuel. Yeah, like as in you're not supposed to use it. Okay. All right, license empty weight, ramp weight, takeoff weight, landing weight, those are real things. How much does this airplane weigh through the normal life cycle of a flight? Okay. Useful load, payload. What does payload mean? Anybody know what payload means? Let me tell you. Something that paid to get on there. That's what you want is some payload, okay? Uh, maximum ramp weight. All right, we had ramp weight. Well, what's the max? Same thing, take off and landing. What is the ace? What does my airplane flight manual tell me about the maximum values in this? And I'll find those in limitations, section two of the AFM. Maximum takeoff weight. Yeah. And it could be different than maximum landing weight, too. We're going to come across one airplane that has. A maximum gross weight more than the maximum takeoff weight. Oh, I'm excited. Anybody know? Gross maximum gross weight that's higher than the maximum takeoff weight. There's one airplane. One airplane that I know about anyways. All right. Something kind of special, right? Okay. All right. Usable fuel. Now, Weight and balance section, right? We got to talk about arm. Arm, sure. Okay. Arm, but a distance from. Some, some distance from an area, okay? Moment, which is weight applied at an arm and causes a rotation, okay? That rotation about that center point. So, sounds a little bit like we're going back to center of gravity, rotation, axis of flight, vertical, horizontal or correction, vertical, longitudinal, and lateral. Moment table, this is just how information is produced and presented to us in order to make informed decisions about loading. Moment limits table, what's the limit? All right, once I chug through the calculation, what's the limit? A loading graph and center of gravity moment envelope, All right? Everybody has seen Top Gun, right? Flying right on the edge of the envelope. Yeah, okay, it's an envelope. The, the area that's defined on a piece of paper as areas that I can fly within and not outside of. Okay, weight times arm equals moment. All right, y'all, if you take a look at this exact uh, equation, which is super simple, this is going to define everything you do with weight and balance. I promise if you know weight times arm equals moment, you can manipulate that just a little bit, you will be fine with weight and balance. It's just all the extra little pieces of weight and balance that we have to uh, wrinkle our nose about. You know, oh, I don't like that, it's kind of interesting. Okay, all right. Fulcrum means a point at which the rotation occurs. So for us, that fulcrum is a center of gravity in an airplane and that fulcrum could move. This example, and when we start talking about the balance, the, the fulcrum is gonna stay in the same place, you know, for the time being, for one little moment, okay? And then I also call that one for this example a datum. The datum means a reference point, or data, all right? But datum is a, a reference point from which I get a measurement. Now, hence the word arm. Okay, the arm is the measurement from which I'm gonna put this weight. I have some sort of weight that I wanna load on an object. 
And I'll load that weight at a certain distance away from the datum plane. The example here is arm A is a minus 50, so it's in front of, along the longitudinal axis, it's in front of the datum plane. And I'll load 50, uh, this case, excuse me, I'm going to load 100 pounds at that 50 inch line. What I come up with is a moment. Weight times arm equals moment. So the weight is 100. Notice it didn't put units, but we're going to just assume pounds. 100 times 50 inches gives me 5,000 inch pounds. Inch pounds is the units that we'll use to express moment. Something by which causes a rotation around that fulcrum. Now on the opposite side, I've placed twice as much weight here, but I did it at exactly half the arm. So the balance is achieved by both sides. I've achieved balance here by equaling out the moments. So I got 200 times 25, 5,000. That one's a minus 5,000. That one's a plus 5,000. The answer is zero. The total moment is zero. No rotation occurs. If one of them is off balance by a little, then a rotation occurs. Okay. All right. Let's continue on. The very first couple of guys that decided they wanted to fly these things, they couldn't carry very much at all. They could carry themselves and about what I remember, I think was a half gallon or seven tenths gallon of fuel, which allowed them to stay in the air almost a half a minute. So they could not go very far at all. And part of that limitation was fuel. Okay. Here, we've got my training airplane, and it 100% carries a lot more fuel, but just like that previous example, also has a center of gravity. One of the very first things that they started studying when they put these airplanes together. How can I put more people on this? How can I put more fuel on this? How can I put stuff that's gonna pay for this in there, okay? And they decided, figured out, let's look at this in terms of longitudinal weight and balance, okay? Vertical weight and balance, and then lateral weight and balance. The, the real lion in the room, or the elephant in the room, if you want to call it, the big topic on weight and balance is that longitudinal shift. There's a little bit with lateral, vertical, we can't affect almost at all, but longitudinal weight and balance, that's the, that's the topic that we're going to discuss in section B. We'll discuss that and then we'll find, hey, what are the limits? If I have a utility category or a normal category airplane, which is just two different categories with respect to certifications of aircraft. So a normal airplane, category class, or a utility airplane, category and class. A lot of that depends on where this airplane is loaded. And I have to load this within the envelope. That is the envelope. That's the envelope that Maverick was talking about. I don't know which envelope they were talking about. It's probably all top secret, right? But this is our envelope. This is the one we're going to use. I got my airplane loaded to however many pounds on that vertical scale. And then I come across to a CG calculation. Okay, good. I put a dot there. We can fly. The airplane has, uh, has been loaded within the acceptable range of CG. So this, these are the tools that we use to figure out if I'm loaded properly or not. Okay, datum. You guys ready to tackle datum? It's not hard. I'm going to put a couple of slides up here, three slides about datum. But let's discuss it. I, I mentioned just a couple minutes ago what datum was. It's okay if, if, because it's a little bit strange, but it's okay if we don't remember. Who remembers what datum is? some sort of a reference, right? If I'm going to make a calculation, I have to say, this is where we start. We're going to start measuring from there. Okay. If not, then how do I know where I started and how do I know that these 
you know, these measurements mean anything. They have no meaning at all if I don't always start from the exact same point. It's not required for aircraft certification for manufacturers to always use the exact same reference line. It's not required at all. They can use a reference line that more accurately expresses their needs for that type of performance. Maybe I have an airplane that I'm performing to take people on long haul trips across the Atlantic or Pacific. Maybe I have an airplane designed to train pilots how to use all of these ideas. All right. So the datum could be in different places for different airplanes. The datum on most uh, training airplanes is going to happen right here. Now, I don't know where this one, I think they have this datum plane looks like, yeah, I don't, I kind of don't like where they put the weight, the datum. It says it's 66.25 inches ahead of the wings leading edge. Okay. So in this exact airplane, they took the datum line and just put it right there. If I load a person inside this airplane, then they're going to load at fuselage station or FS 71, 72, wherever they have their seat. Okay. It's called a fuselage station. If I load baggage in there, maybe I'm loading baggage at 130, 130 inches behind that datum line. And that's called station 130 or fuselage station 130. Okay. So you'll see this written on some AFMs just exactly like so. Fuselage station 130 means that for that airplane, wherever the manufacturer placed the datum line, 130 inches behind that is where I'm going to load baggage. Okay. All right. Nobody's going to come to the school with a, with a tape measure. Nobody's going to come there with a meter stick. Okay. You're not going to measure anything. You'll get that from the charts in the book. Here's another example of a datum plane. Oh, good. A Cessna 172. The datum plane is at the firewall. That small piece of sheet metal that's between me and the engine that if there was a fire would cause some sort of small barrier between me and all the occupants in there and, and the fire itself. That's where your datum line is. So if I put passengers in here, They'd be behind the datum line. I put pilot in there, pilot's behind the datum line. I put fuel in the fuel tank. The fuel is 48 inches behind the datum line, right? 48 inches is the one for the Cessna 172 for fuel. I don't know. How, I, it's like two days. I don't know why I remember that, but 48 inches for the fuel. All right, another one. 109.7 inches ahead of the center of the main landing gear. Fine. The idea is manufacturers can put that wherever it is and then they formulate the rest of their charts based on that datum line. All right. Here we got a SR 72. Okay. Fast airplane, basic empty weight, 60,000 pounds, maximum takeoff weight, 145. So talking about maximum takeoff weight, maximum ramp, maximum landing weight. What do we have with this thing? You can load airplanes on the ramp to a certain amount, 2,316 pounds. All right. Now I'm going to use that 16 pounds taxiing, and then I got a maximum takeoff weight. So maybe my maximum takeoff weight is 2,300. Most training airplanes have the same landing weight as you do for taxi. Some airplanes have a different landing weight than they have for a takeoff weight, a lower landing weight for a takeoff weight. Now, crazy example, a pilot goes up, they start flying, life is great, they got it loaded, it's full of passengers, it's full of fuel, they're below their takeoff weight, naturally, so they take off and experience a problem, and it was a bad problem, and they were above their maximum landing weight. What did this pilot do? He stayed in the air and everybody died because he was not under his maximum landing weight. Let me tell you, I don't care about a maximum landing weight. And I urge you the same thing. If you have an emergency, 
land the airplane, don't wait in the air and die like this pilot did, okay? So maximum landing weight, yes, that is a real thing. But in the emergency, remember, you can go outside of the, any rules at all, all right? Now this specific example, empty weight is 60,000 pounds. Then they load the thing all up and the maximum takeoff weight is 145. Then the maximum aircraft weight was actually 170. Like you said, it was a government airplane. They were refueling this thing and it could contain more fuel and crews after it took off. It could, it could contain more weight than it could before it took off. Kind of crazy. Just the idea of maximum ramp, maximum takeoff, maximum landing weight could be different. All right, now we get to the teeter-totter. You guys okay with teeter-totter? Just schoolyard, playground thing, okay, fine. All my Latin students will say, teeter-totter, what the hell are you talking about? You know what else, let me tell you, hang on a second, hang on. Let me, go, let me go through some culture with you guys real quick. So long time I've been teaching, primarily it was either uh, Spanish students or Caribbean students, right? I, would, I use the example and the references of Airplane quite a, uh, quite a bit. Remember, you guys have seen the movie Airplane? Everybody seen the movie Airplane? You know, surely you don't expect me to land there. Yeah, exactly. You got Otto, he pumps up, and he's like, yes, I do expect you to land there. Stop calling me Shirley. Look, I don't know how many times I uh, made a reference to the movie Airplane to my South American neighbors, and they had no clue what I was talking about. And then as soon as I started teaching Russian students, they're all like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Watched airplane. Crazy. All right, so here we go. Teeter-totter. I got a fulcrum here in the middle. That's where the balance point is. Balance point, keep in mind, this symbol is your center of gravity. All right, I got the kid over here 64 inches away and 50 pounds. I got the kid over here 50 pounds, 64 inches. Balance. Life is good. Everything is balanced. What happens if one kid jumps off? Well, 50 pounds, and it causes an imbalance. Okay, so this kid accelerated until their butt hit the ground. There was a rotation here, and then it stopped. Just to think about how that F equals MA, but it still causes movement. In this example, on weight and balance will cause a rotation. Now, Tim, 50 pounds, moves 10 inches forward. Mary, 110 pounds, or correction, Mary, 50 pounds, and 110. The seesaw is 50 pounds, 60 inches, and they come through. What do they find? Total 150 pounds, 9,000 pound inches, and it's balanced. All right, fantastic. Take the same example, and I got a heavier child with a lighter child. Once again, the rotation. All right. So 85 pounds, 110 inches. This child, Bert, is 45 pounds, 10 inches, accelerating up. How could I make these two balance? I got to move Susan. Because it's America, we can't make the boy heavier than the girl. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, exactly. I would have to take her and I move her forward. If I move her forward, I could achieve balance. So this is now beginning to give us an example of moment. The more moment I have, the more force I have to rotate. The longer the arm I have, the more force I'll have to rotate because it's a bigger arm, okay? Which will give me a bigger moment. Now, we're going to talk about controllability. None of this stuff at all, we don't have kids, but let's bring this back to an airplane for a, minute, for a little bit. Okay? Center of gravity is where? Somewhere here. Okay? Is it in front of the total lift or behind the total lift? Oh, boy. We got some stability reinforced. Everybody remembers that stability segment. That was fun. I looked out there and this is what I saw. <laughs> All right, that's fine, yeah. Stability, so center of gravity exists somewhere. All the movement causes a rotation around that center of gravity. So where is my total of lift? Behind 
Well, what, what makes it so my airplane doesn't go like this? A force down here. Okay. All right. We're getting there. That's tremendously important. And it starts coming back to the weight and balance idea. All right, let's leave Bert and Susan alone for a little bit. Go back to an empty airplane. Empty airplane. What is an empty airplane? Empty airplane is the way it came from the manufacturer plus any type of new stuff that I've put in here. So every time I change something, if I, in, if I uh, uh, modify the radios and I put in new improved radios, I got to take it back to a maintenance technician and they give me my empty weight. Empty weight also includes that oil most of the time, okay? <coughs> oil is already included and it includes my unusable fuel. So some little bit of fuel in there that I'm not authorized to use, okay? I have 56 gallons in the airplane. I can only use 53, okay? The rest of it just sits in the lines and is not able to be used. So that's my empty airplane. I find that from the AFM, not a POH. We'll look at a POH. We have a POH here with us. We'll look at one, but that doesn't describe that exact airplane. That is a sample problem that's included in the POH. If I want the exact empty weight for that airplane, remember it's an AFM. I get that weight and balance information out of that section. All right, so again, here's my empty weight. I know what the arm is for the CG. And then I know what my moment is by multiplying the two. Then I add a pilot. Pilot weighs 135. They sit at 73 inches. And that gives me a moment, 98.55. All we did is 135 on a calculator, 73 inches. You come up with 98.55. You get a total weight. Then you get the total moment. And you manipulate that equation so that I get arm equals moment divided by weight. All right? So arm, moment divided by weight. Take the total moment, divide it by weight, get your 73 pound, or 73 and 70.3 inches. Okay. That is your new CG. Now, terrible airplane, terrible weight and balance or load manifest. You know why? I don't have any fuel. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. I just got some pilot sitting in the airplane, no fuel because empty airplane does not include my fuel. So, so far we've started this calculation, but I can't fly it. All right, fine and fantastic. The example here that we're talking about with Bert and Susan, these two, they were able to balance out if I move Susan closer. But now we're in an airplane. We're not gonna move weight around just to balance the airplane necessarily, but instead, as long as I can load it within limits, I'm gonna load it to a CG. So the CG is gonna move slightly. Not on the ground, I got this thing sitting on three wheels. Right? The load is carried by the wheels. But as soon as I start flying, which is what I'm trying to achieve, I experience a CG. And all of the flight loads act on this airplane now through the CG. You guys were north and south of me all day when we were talking about CG and stability. I know you understand it. But I have a lift that's produced by this tail section, specifically that horizontal stabilizer. And it can only produce so much lift up or down. And I change the lift based on how I use the yoke. But the force that occurs on this airplane is the product of that lift times the arm. So it is in this case, that's right. So the arm from the CG to the center lift here. That's a very huge arm. That's why this is not very big compared to that wing. 
right? Because I have a longer arm. If I load the CG aft and go all the way to the limit, there's less arm. So the airplane is a little bit less stable. Now, let's talk about something real fun real quick. If I have my CG at the aft limit, remember that lift now is really close. So if I produce lift, I'm not producing as much of a, of a, of a twisting motion because the lift and the CG are really close. So I need less tail force, just a little bitty tail force now to balance it. Less lift back here gives me what? Less drag, yeah, so a faster airplane. Put more in the back of the airplane, you get a faster airplane. By how much? Well, just very little. Okay? But I get a faster airplane that's a little bit less stable. Okay. All right, we're going to get into results of changing the CG and so forth in a little while. But the idea behind this is we started with a couple of uh, students that were on a teeter-totter, and they had this thing that was just stuck there in the middle. They weren't able to, to change where the, the fulcrum was or the CG was. Now we said, hey, I got an airplane. I get this thing in the air. It shifts wherever the CG is. Well, Bert and Susan can shift where the, the CG is. Now they got it in a little spindle where they can move it. All right. Here are the normal features that you'll load or the normal components that you'll load on a training flight. Empty airplane, pilot, a front seat passenger, we'll call this an instructor, a rear seat passenger, word to the wise, pro tip, as I call it, a pro tip or a life hack, all right? I'm full of them, ask me and I'll share them all with you. Something that will help you be successful. If your friend is flying, then it would help if you said, hey friend, do you mind if I sit in the back seat? You're doing two things. You're watching what's going on, or you're listening to, watching and listening, and you're also giving your friend a rearward CG and making the airplane a little easy to fly. All right, so back seat on those flights. Instead of taking two flights a day effectively, you could be in the airplane three or four times, and in that last part, you're relaxing a little bit, drinking your water, doing whatever, but still listening to what's going on live with your radio, and also sharing the experience with that person up front. Not a good time to start asking a bunch of questions because remember, the person in the front is the one that's paying for it, and the person in the front is the one that's supposed to be taking the lesson, but a good time to observe. All right, anyhow, so yeah, rear seat passengers, their baggage, this gives me 78 pounds of baggage. That's baloney. Training airplanes, you want, you'll have a couple quarts of oil back there, maybe a, a way to, to sample the fuel, right? Just a few pounds, don't carry a lot of stuff in the back of the airplane, unless there's a reason for it. Sometimes there are because of loading, all right? And then fuel, don't forget to add the fuel because the first example we had, I, that pilot couldn't fly anywhere. There's no fuel in the air, but they just sit there, they can chair fly, they're not doing anything, right? You gotta add some fuel to it. All the way down, now you get the total weight. That has to be within limitations, and also the CG has to be in limitations. So if I'm over on this, I already know I gotta shed something. I gotta get rid of some bags or tell somebody they gotta sit on the ground. Or get rid of some fuel, because that's way too much, it honestly is.
have these classes in Sky Eagle Aviation Academy. Check out please our website www.atp.academy for details. All right. How do I find out what the CG is then? We got all this stuff. Something big that's missing is I don't know where it's all loaded. You're not going to go out to the airplane, like I said, with a measuring device and measure to the middle of each seat and measure to where the fuel tank is. It's all on a chart. It's in the AFM. Find out exactly, hey, where is this? Where's that seat at, passenger and, and, and uh, pilot? On the 172, typically 37 inches. The seat slides forward. The seat slides back because people are different sizes. Same like you'll have in a car. So 37 inches is average, but you might take it either way. All right, use 37, make it easy. Rear passengers typically sit at 73. So they're at 73 pounds, and I just happen to memorize those because I've been flying these things forever. 95 pounds to the back of baggage area A, you won't have anything in that, and 123 to the back of baggage uh, B. Again, you won't have anything there. But I know what my arms are. What do I do with these arms? By what? The weight that's loaded at that station, okay? And that gives me the moment, just like so. So you can fill in the entire chart. Where is the fuel? At the bottom, fuel. Yeah. Ah, 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 all right. So where is the fuel? I love that question. The fuel is not listed on that picture. The fuel is listed usually in a small paragraph hidden inside the text somewhere else. I don't know why they did it like that. But I'll tell you what the fuel, mo the fuel arm is on a 172 if you want to write it down. It's 48. Okay? So I just remember two days, 48, that's my fuel. There's your fuel. What do they have on this? I think they put 46. Who knows? Whatever. Like, again, this is not, it says in the 172 that Jepson's doing it something. All right? Multiply it by, get your moment. Now, once I got those, that entire chart filled out, what do I do with that information? You have your total weight. You multiplied them all through and got your moments. What do you do now? Well, you said I'm dividing the total weight by CG, and I'm not. There it is, right there. Remember, I got to multi or I got to divide total moment by total weight, and that will give me my CG. Okay. It, it's, it's a simple uh, calculation, but I tell you, half the time, pilots are not going to do this very well. I'm going to give you another little secret. All right. Truth be known, sometimes you get a flight instructor that's running a little bit behind schedule. I think we're the worst. Usually, it's not the first flight of the day. All right. Usually the person that flew in front of you that had something go wrong, whatever the case is, you, flexibility is important during the flight training thing. It, it just truly, truly is. That's why if you come to, to flight train, we usually recommend just leave your schedule open. It will work. Practice some patience. Allow yourself to go through the day and then we'll figure out tomorrow and then we'll figure out the next day. Okay. But Truth be known, sometimes whatever happened, ATC, the airport closed, they're at another airport, that person came back a little bit later, you won't have either an airplane or a student, or, correction, an airplane or a flight instructor for a little bit of time when you show up. Does it happen always? No. Does it happen sometimes? Sure. What do you do? Do your weight and balance. Do your flight plan, right? Did you have a quiz that you're supposed to do? You do that, right? Get that stuff done. Because I can tell you right now that uh, it's, you know, I'm showing up and, and a pilot had a question. They have me, you know, really helping them out. I spent an additional 10, maybe 15 minutes. When I'm with you, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Now, I'm not, you know, I'll try my best to get there for the next person as soon as I can. But if I got an opportunity right here to spend another 10, 15, whatever minutes and really help you out, I'm going to do it. 
As soon as I get on the ground, I'm walking in, you know, to the, to the room. Apologies, certainly so. I'm trying to get some water. I know I got to drink water, maybe grab something and shovel it down my face to eat, right? And I got to go to the bathroom and I get to get it back out the airplane, fly again. I'm going to ask you a very, very simple question. And I'm going to ask you when I first come in, where's our weight and balance and performance data sheet? Where's our load manifest? And I'll tell you right now, 98% of the time, that pilot's gonna sit there and say, well, hell, I'm 15 minutes late. I still gotta sign that log book, drink some water, go to the bathroom, try to eat some Triscuits, all right? So do your weight and balance. Have these things ready to go. Have these things 100% always ready to go, all right? That's just life hack, like I said, pro tip. Once I get that answer, I got my total weight. I know what my CG is. Go back to that same graph that we looked at slide two in this section. Come up to weight, go over, find your CG location, come up, cross the two. I'm either loaded in a normal category or utility. All right. So easy question as I come through, what category airplane are we gonna fly today? Uh, yeah. Single engine. Oh shit, no, right? All right, don't let me get you. I'm already here, you guys, you guys know, I'm telling you, all right, here we go. All right, uh, same thing. Depending on the aircraft manufacturer, you could have a few different ways that that information is presented to you. So this is normal. This is a typical Cessna 172. This is a normal Beechcraft type situation. You're not always going to fly the same airplane. Uh, during training usually, and you'll be in a 172, but then that rapidly turns into something else. So some of these will have an arm already in the columns, and you just come down to your weight, and you move over, and then you write it down. You don't need a calculator, in other words, okay? Then you come over to your moment limits, and you write that down as well. There is, there's this crazy thing called a moment index. You guys see this uh, moment value that we have, 98,146. So be prepared for this. There's a moment, which is 98,146. And then there's this guy. That's a moment index. Whoever thought this up just completely added a layer of complexity. It shouldn't have been that way, I suppose, but it is. So all this is, is right? 981. Yeah, if you want to put 0.5, you could do that because you're rounding. But that's the most that you'll get out of it. So this is a moment, and this is a moment index. Easy? Nobody's confused, right? What's that? What's the purpose? The purpose is to make this, this answer easier to use. If I were to do this on a larger airplane, like a King Air, it, this number is going to be a lot of digits plus several commas. So it might be a moment index of moment divided by 10,000. And it makes this easier to use, but it still gives me the same type of answer because I can multiply or divide by one, by 10, a hundred, a thousand, whatever. And I haven't changed the value. I've just changed how many digits I'm going to use. Okay. We're going to get into significant digits just a little bit or that's just not significant. Everything into the other side. Okay. So where this becomes a problem for pilots in the training environment is when they try to get the CG. Because if you divide this by your total weight, you're going to get an answer that is off by a lot. Yeah. So if I'm working with moment index and I'm trying to use the formula for total moment divided by total weight, I really need to put those other zeros back on there before I do it. Okay. All right. Now then. This one uses moment indexes, and it makes it easy for that chart. 
Uh, and then they've, they've, when they put it back over on the opposite side, it looks like they used the same because they weren't, they weren't solving for a CG. They were looking at whatever the weight is and making sure that moment index was between the lower limit and the upper limit, or the forward limit and the aft limit. That's all they were doing. Your Cessna 172 doesn't have this, but it does have that. It's got two. It's got the first one that we talked about where you just list it out on a notepad and then you get the answer, okay? It also has the graph and the graph has a moment index. The graph has a loaded moment here. It's usually 100, 200, 300, so it'll have a moment index. Easy for me to use the graph because I follow the line for either rear seats, fuel, pilot and front seats, I follow this line until I get the weight. And then once I get the weight, I come down and find my loaded moment. Add the weights, add the moments, and come to a new chart. And then I find out, all right, do I, am I loaded within the limits, okay? Those limit charts will look like this. Center of gravity, and I got my uh, weight here. And I got my moment index. Look at that, moment divided by 100. So here I got two different charts placed on one. I could find my weight and compare it to center of gravity, get the answer. Or I could find my weight and follow the dash lines to my moment index and see if I'm within the limits. Utility category, this entire airplane is utility category. Oh, acrobatic category on the inside of this one. So depending on how I load this airplane, I could load it to acrobatic category. All right. All right, clear as mud. Clear as mud. If you thought that was fun, try to shift weight. I might have an airplane that's loaded out of limits. I might have me and an instructor and another person in the back seat, okay? Suppose that's a bad example because if I need an instructor, I can't have the other person sit in the front. But let's say I'm certified and I have me and I have my wife and then I have a friend of mine in the back seat. And that friend of mine is as heavy as me. Okay, so when we get in this airplane, all of us together, now I'm loaded beyond the aft limit. So I could find out using this formula by moving the weight of that person by switching these two passengers, if that will allow me to be within limits. I don't, what's that? Well, of course. Or change the wife for another woman, right? Yeah, why not? <laughs> My goodness. That's even better. All right. So weight moved divided by the weight of the airplane equals distance to CG moved divided by distance between the arms that are moving the thing, okay? There is a way for me to calculate simply how I could change uh, my CG based on changing weight. What am I gonna do? Just do a whole nother way. It didn't take long to do this thing in the first place, right? Just take your eraser, scratch these things out. And until you get to the commercial program, you don't need to demonstrate proficiency in doing this at all. So again, another thing that I call nice to know, but not need to know. An example of it, here's your conditions, 2,500 pounds. That's the airplane loaded weight, so we're pretty much at gross. Distance between front and rear seat, 36 inches. Distance to CG needs to move forward is two inches, okay? How much weight do I have to move? Airplane is 2,500, I need to move two inches. The difference between the front seat and the back seat is 36. So 5,000 divided by 36, I have to move 138.8 pounds. So in this example, I have to take that person and put them to the front, okay? If you guys wanna take pictures of that or, or, or kinda put that in your knowledge bank for later, do it, but don't lose sleep over this one. We're, we're, we're right there at a point where CG is nice and weight and balance is nice. All right. Oh, got it. 
Same type of thing here. I'm going to move 162 pounds. The airplane weighs 2,500. How far do I need, or how much will the CG move if I change it 36 inches? So if I change 36 inches, well, 2.3 inches is how far that CG moves. All right. Jepson really kind of got into that. I think they're kind of setting the stage for commercial pilot. 156 pounds is, what is moving, 2,500 pounds is how much the airplane weighs. Distance CG needs to move is 1.5. I got to move that 24 inches. That's how much is in the back. Okay. All right, remember, most of this is all longitudinal CG. I'm not concerned very much at all with lateral CG, how much the CG moves laterally. Some airplanes have a limitation. And if the limitation exists, it will list in the AFM under section two limitations. You could have no more than 30 pound difference between two fuel tanks, in other words, okay? We do not have that limitation on a 172. But if I have a full tank here and an empty tank there, it will cause a rolling moment. I, you're, I, I have no idea how you would cause an imbalance so much that you'd get an actual rolling moment. I, I, get what's that? Well, a fuel tank possibly, but even then, even, even if I had 25 gallon or 25 pounds in that left tank, I seriously doubt that you're gonna notice it that much, okay?